All right, so um, for next time, you're not gonna be reading an essay. Uh, what you're gonna be reading is an excerpt from a play. So it's a Greek tragedy, although in this case a tragedy that does not end unhappily, uh, by Aeschylus called the Eumenides. Um, now, Eumenides is a Greek word that means kindly ones. And the kindly ones was a, was a popular euphemism for a group of goddesses called the Furies. Do any of you know who the Furies were in Greek mythology? Like Did you say dog face women from hell? <laughs> sort of, yeah. I mean, yeah, they're underworld goddesses, right? Do you know what their function was? Like what they what, what they did? Very well for evil Yeah. So the whole Greek concept of the underworld, the afterlife, right? Everybody gets the same afterlife, whether you were good or bad. Um, you're just, you know, you're a shadow floating around underground. Um, with no real memories of your past life on Earth, right? Um, unless you were a horrible blasphemer or a trick or offend the gods in some way, in which you end up, you know, with an eagle tearing out your liver, um, or you know, constantly trying to reach for fruit that is uh, that is just beyond your grasp, uh, or chained to a wheel of fire, <laughs> things things of that nature, right? So. The way like normal mortal evildoers were actually punished according to Greek mythology was that they were hounded by these three goddesses called the Furies, right? So your punishment came on Earth rather than in the afterlife. So what hap what's happening in this play, right? A murderer has just been acquitted and forgiven. And the goddess Athena is trying to placate the Furies who feel like they've been robbed of their prey, right? Who feel like they've been disrespected by this decision. So what I want you guys paying attention to is the rhetorical moves that Athena makes to try to placate the Furies, right? What does she do, what does she say to try to get them on board with the decision? Do any of you know who or what Athena was? I was honestly about to ask you that. Because I don't remember which one she was. Yeah, by, yeah, she's the goddess of wisdom, right, of military strategy. And she's also the patron goddess of the city of Athens. And now she's trying to get somebody killed. Oh, no, no, she's not trying to get somebody killed. She actually just, she helped get somebody off. <laughs> and uh, she is trying to convince the Furies that it's okay, right? And that it doesn't mean that they're being disrespected, that their social role is diminished, right? Now, while we are talking, uh, you know, since it really our kind of our whole subject for today is, um, you know, kind of like Greek and Roman culture, um, everybody knows what's this weekend, right? Yep, Valentine's Day, right? Mm -hmm. Do we know what the origins of Valentine's Day are? <coughs> yeah, that's a Hallmark. <laughs> okay, Hallmark, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Hallmark has certainly exacerbated it, yeah. They made it so angry. I'm looking like, y'all make all the same when people feel bad about themselves. Like, don't we need somebody? <laughs> when we could. <laughs> so, on February 14th in ancient Rome, there was a holiday called Lupercalia. Lupercalia means festival of the wolf. So according to Roman legend, the twin brothers who founded the city, Romulus and Remus, were abandoned in the woods and raised by a she-wolf. So Lupercalia was intended to commemorate that deified she-wolf who had um, raised the founders, right? So here's how this worked in practice. Um, young aristocratic Roman men would run around naked in the streets, slapping women with wolf skins. I would kill somebody if they did that to me. I'm sorry, but you're <laughs> Well, they're, they're doing it to ensure fertility in the coming year, right? 
and that's like virtually, yeah. virtually yeah. all, virtually all, yeah, virtually all pagan holiday, virtually all, like virtually all pagan holidays are fertility festivals, and virtually all of our holidays are old pagan fertility festivals that were repurposed by the early church, because things like people running around naked slapping each other with wolf skins wasn't really the kind of thing that uh, that they were into. Um, so, you know, they, they take this old Roman holiday, uh, they make up a saint, St. Valentine, who's a kind of composite of a couple of other figures, um, and they kind of sanitize the holiday, and now it's all about giving people chocolates and roses and little cards with, with bare-bottomed winged babies, right? Cupid? Yes. Yeah, well... Cupid. But, like, you didn't say it. You just said it's kind of... Yeah, well, because... Because... What we call Cupid looks nothing like what the Romans would have imagined as Cupid, right? So they imagined Cupid as more like a teenage boy um, of exceptional beauty with wings uh, who shot arrows at people. The little bare-bottomed baby with wings uh, comes from re uh, Renaissance Italian art and is called a putti. So that's a side issue I hadn't intended to get into. <laughs> but, but yeah, that, but that is another way that we kind of revise and repurpose classical tradition um, to suit contemporary sensibilities. Which, you know, like, you know, again, like we're talking today about, um, you know, an art form or a science from the ancient world that has carried over into the present. So this is all, at least on some level, relevant. So let's talk a little bit about Aristotle. And how'd this go for you? What did you guys think of this? That's good. Okay. It was fine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not much to say about it. Okay. Well, what what would you say about it? <laughs> okay. He used a lot of like analogies that you would think about rhetoric, like talking about the lawyer and stuff like that. Okay. So that's something we could all relate yeah, to yeah. one way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of what he has to say has to it, it, it is about law courts, right? Which was something Plato also talked a little bit about law courts, right? right. Um, but it wasn't the main focus right. of what of, of his piece. Yeah. Okay. Good. Anything else that you guys that jumped out of you guys in this? Are there good questions about? He kept repeating himself with like this or that. Like he kept doing that like throughout while he was explaining stuff. So. And it uh -huh. kind of confused me because I'll be reading it and then I'll be reading that multiple times and I'll be like, wait a minute. Uh -huh. can, can, <laughs> like, can you give me an example? Um, one or what page? Uh, starts on page uh, 133. Okay, uh, where, what page is that on? It would be on 33. 133, okay. Do you want me to read the sentence or y'all got it? Uh, yeah, if you could please read the sentence. Okay, again, a lit, a lit, can you say? Litigant. Uh, litigant. Okay, so I see where you are now. Yeah, has clearly nothing to do but to show the alleged fact that is or is not so, and that has or has not happened. But okay. that kind of stripped me up reading it because it was like, Okay, that, that, that sometimes he'll, he'll, he'll say the same thing, but in a slightly different way. Yeah, and it was just kind of like... Okay, yeah, and some, yeah. sometimes that reads just like kind of piling clauses on top of each other, right? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that actually has to do with the way Aristotle thinks, which is different in a lot of ways from the way Plato thinks, even though Aristotle was Plato's uh, star student, right? So let's go back quickly and review what the positions in the Gorgias were, right? So if we look at, for example, the beliefs and arguments of Gorgias and the Sophists, 
right? What did Borges and the Sophists believe? Wasn't it like true, it's true song? Mm -hmm. It has to do with truth. Uh, you cannot know absolute truth, the closest thing to it is, yeah. was it rhetoric or something like that. Something mm -hmm. on the lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That there is no absolute truth, or that if there is, we can't know it. And the best we can do. is create belief. Making persuasive arguments. Yep, through argument. Yep. And for Gorgias, or at least for the version of Gorgias who appears in Plato's dialogue, what is the end goal of rhetoric? What does rhetoric get you if you learn it? Yeah. Yeah. It's a means of, yeah, it's a means of getting what you want, right? And getting other people, by getting other people to do what you want. Now, what about Plato's view? Not just of rhetoric, but of reality in general, right? So if we remember, uh, if we think back to that allegory of the cave, right? What does Plato believe about reality? That there are absolute truths. Okay, yeah, there is absolute, there is such a thing as absolute truth, right? Absolute truth exists. And I think you're kind of alluding to this when you're talking about falsehood here, right? But like, what, what does he believe about the nature of reality? So everything is like a composition, or it's whenever you're talking about, you're making the comparison between like, uh, Medicine and cookery and Okay, yeah, that every real thing or every valuable thing has a counterfeit version, right? Like a false um, opposite. Um, and this actually does kind of relate to his central notion about reality. Like, right? what does Plato regard as more real? Ideas or the things that we sense in the world? Yeah, ideas are real, right? And what we sense in the world might not actually be there. Like it's, it's just a projection of that idea. It's like yeah. what we're talking about with this table. Yeah, yeah. Ideas are real, and things are just imitations of ideas, right? So for Plato, Right, ideas, right, these general notions or universals are more important and more real than the specific expressions of those universals in the sensible world, right? The world that we can sense. So things or specific objects a philosopher would call particulars, and the kinds of general ideas or general concepts that particulars imitate, Plato would call universals, right? Now, what does he believe about rhetoric and about democracy? What's Plato's attitude towards democracy? Uh, it's, uh, it's too susceptible to uh, influence. Yeah, so direct democracy was the political system that existed when he was young, right, in Athens. Okay. But yeah, his attitude towards it, yeah, is that democracy is sloppy, chaotic, and subject to whim and opinion. Right, because it's not based on universals, it's not based on universal principles. It's based on appeals to particular people in a particular moment, right? And so what's his attitude towards rhetoric? How does Plato feel about rhetoric? Yeah. 
it's an inferior copy, it's a fake copy of philosophy, right? It's a counterfeit version. Just as cookery is a counterfeit of medicine and cosmetics are a counterfeit of gymnastics, right? Okay. So let's think then about what you read for today and try to figure out where Aristotle fits in here. Does he seem to agree with either of these earlier thinkers? He agrees with Plato. Why would you say he agrees with Plato? Because like the first sentence he has is rhetoric is the counterpart of dialogue. Counterpart though, right? Yeah. What's a counterpart? Yeah, counter Yeah, counterparts work alongside each other, right? Counterparts are things that are more or less equivalent or they complement each other, right? So what is rhetoric for him the counterpart of? Dialectic. Dialectic, yep. The rhetoric and dialectic go together, right? That they are not, in fact, opposed to each other. Now, this is not what Plato's view was, right? What was di what is dialectic? Does, any, does everybody understand what that is? It means discussion. Or discussion. Some other word for it. Yeah, it's the basic model for uh, the Gorgias and for all of Plato's dialogues, right? Every everything Plato wrote, he wrote as a dialogue between two or more people. And the basic idea is that through discussion, conversation, and questioning, right, you get at truth. So, does rhetoric work through conversation in the same way dialectic does? Yes. It works through language, right? Right. But does a rhetorician sit and have a conversation with you? Or does a rhetorician get up and give a speech? See, that's what I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so rhetoric is, what, is more one-sided, right? It's like... If I was to just stand up here and talk at you instead of asking you questions and trying to draw things out of you. So the basic process that we use in this classroom is dialectic, right? I probably talk more than anybody else, but I also frequently ask you for input, right? And together we're trying to work towards figuring out what's going on. Um, if I wanted to make this classroom more rhetorical, Right? It would be like the traditional lecture where I stand behind the podium and I read things to you. And if I'm engaging, and if I'm persuasive, you'll listen, right? But you won't be participating. There won't necessarily be a back and forth, right? So think of this, you know, if it helps, even in terms of like a, in a formal debate. Now, I know that this is actually not usually the way political debates go in this country anymore. Mm -hmm. Are the candidates supposed to be allowed to interrupt each other? Yeah, they're not supposed to, right? And if the moderator is actually enforcing the rules, right, they can't interrupt each other. Um, you know, this past electoral cycle was extremely frustrating in that regard, right? It's like, just, just let somebody finish a freaking sentence, right? <laughs> I feel like the moderator was like, you know what, I'm going to quit, because I can't even stop them from yeah. talking. <laughs> well, yeah, no, 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 the thing with, like, you know, the, the third of the two final presidential debates, it was much more, it probably didn't change anyone's minds, but it was much less chaotic and much more productive because the moderator was enforcing the rules and shutting people's mics off when they were trying to interrupt each other, right? <laughs> but yeah, the way formal rhetorical situations like debate tend to work is that each person gets to say their piece, right? So even like in a court of law, right, one of the most common rhetorical situations a contemporary person encounters, like, you know, not necessarily as defendants, right, but, you know, I certainly hope that none of you are in that position anytime soon. Um, but, uh, you know, the, when the prosecutor is 
making her opening statement or her closing statement. The defense attorney is not allowed to interrupt, right? You can make objections when they're questioning witnesses, but you can't interrupt when they're opening and closing, when they're making their final statement. Oh, and the same, pardon? I didn't know that. And the, yeah, the same goes for uh, the defense, right? You know, the, the prosecutor can't interrupt the defense when the defense is making the opening and closing arguments, right? And even objections have to be made by a formal process, right? You appeal to the judge, and the judge decides whether to sustain or overrule your objection. So yeah, so when we're talking about rhetorical, so we're talking about rhetoric, we're talking much more about formal structured speech than dialectic. But yeah, one thing that Aristotle is saying is these two things are actually counterparts that work hand in hand with each other. And let's look a little bit more closely at Aristotle's own context and what Aristotle himself generally argued for in this and other works, right? So Aristotle lived in the 4th century BCE. And Plato, being about a generation older, uh, still had a memory of what Athenian direct democracy was like. Aristotle doesn't. Aristotle never lives under a democratic system. Um, you know, by the time he's an adult, um, Athens has been ruled first by Spartan dictators, and then by you know King Philip of Macedonia, who then hires Aristotle to be the tutor to his son, who becomes the Emperor Alexander. Right. So. Um, Aristotle's whole experience of government is as a, you know, oligarchy or monarch, right? No direct experience of democracy. He is the founder of a school of philosophers called the Peripatetics. So Peripatetic uh, comes from a Greek word that means walking around. This name doesn't really have anything to do with the peripatetics ideas. Um, rather, it comes from the fact that because Aristotle wasn't an Athenian citizen, he wasn't born there, he wasn't allowed to own property. So when he founded his own school, they met in, on the public roadways and walked around while he lectured, right? So the wall, so, pardon? I say you begin your steps in that day. Yeah, really. <laughs> so, um, the big difference between, well, one of the big differences between Aristotle and Plato is this attitude towards the universal and the particular, right? So, Plato believes that universals are all important and the particulars are just pale imitations of universals, right? Aristotle believes that we can only comprehend universals if we first examine and categorize particulars. Right, so for Plato, the general idea or concept, the category, matters more than the specific thing. Aristotle is arguing, how do we know what category something belongs to if we don't actually examine specific things? So he is much more focused on the, tangib the tangible physical world um, than Plato was. And he believes that reason, as a human capacity, converts our sense impressions into knowledge. Now, this also implies a slightly different attitude towards knowledge than Plato had, right? So for Plato, was there any such thing as false knowledge? Mm -hmm. No. 
knowledge and belief are opposites, right? Right, knowledge is that which is absolutely objectively true and indisputable, and belief is whatever you fancy, right? Yeah. Aristotle believes that because we get knowledge from kind of converting our sense impressions of particulars into universals, right? That knowledge is sometimes faulty, right? There is such a thing as false knowledge. That sometimes we just don't process correctly or we get the information wrong. So for Aristotle, knowledge doesn't always mean truth. That it is possible for, in Aristotle's scheme of things, to know things that aren't true. Does this make sense? Everybody with me? Okay, so to give you an example of how Aristotle thinks reason works, right? How many of you are, how many of you are familiar with the syllogism? Do any of you know what a syllogism is? So it took you to another page. <laughs> okay. I didn't even bother going to that page. So a syllogism is essentially the application of a general principle to a specific case to test whether or not logically the principle applies, right? So the classic example is all humans are mortal, right? This is the general principle. And then we apply it to a specific case Socrates is human, and therefore, if Socrates is human and all humans are mortal, what can we then deduce about Socrates? He's mortal. Yes, that Socrates is mortal. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly how this works. It, it, it's, it's basically math without numbers. Um, now, all a syllogism will tell you is whether or not a proposition is logical, not whether or not it's true. So, if I were to say, right, all fish can fly, Rachel is a fish. Therefore, Rachel can fly. It makes sense as a syllogism, right? It's logical, but it's not true. Right? Because fish can't fly. Rachel is not a fish. And she cannot fly, as far as I know. Yes? Yeah, I can fly. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> so, yeah. So, reason can't always get us to truth. What it does do is synthesize our sense experience into categories. Right? And Aristotle loves categories. He loves dividing things up into different categories and imagine things are the categories that belong and things like that. Like that that's, kind of like, that's the thing that seems to make him happiest. If I was to imagine what makes Aristotle happy. That's... Okay, so let's, with all this in mind, try to dig into the essay itself and see what we can do with it. So we've already noted from that first sentence that Aristotle's attitude is different here, right? That he is not coming at this from a point of attack. Can I get somebody to continue uh, reading that paragraph? So from rhetoric is the counterpart of dialectic. I guess I can do it. All right. Thank you. 
So both alike are concerned with such things as come more or less within the general kin of all men and belong to no definite science according, accordingly. All men make use more or less of both. For, for to a certain extent, all men attempt to discuss statements and to maintain them, to defend themselves and to attack others. Ordinarily, oh, ordinary, not bad. People okay. do this either at random or through practice and from acquired habit. Both, way, both ways possible, both ways being possible. The subject can plainly be handled systematically for this, for it is possible to inquire the reason why some speakers succeed their practice and others spontaneously. And every and everyone will at once agree with such an inquiry in that art and the function of an art. Okay, thank you. So how is he point how is he pointing out what's similar about rhetoric and dialectic? What do they have in common with each other? How are they alike? Okay, yeah. They both use language, yeah. Yeah. They're both concerned with language. Yeah, they're both general, right? Good. How else are they similar? Mm -hmm. with discussing statements to maintain them, defending themselves, or doing to attack. Like you use both of them for the type of actions with discussing something. Yeah, so it's you know, using language to defend or attack particular ideas, right? And this actually sounds a little bit like some of Gorgias's language. Right? Remember that Gorgias used those kind of combat metaphors mm -hmm. in talking about rhetoric. Fighting, attacking, defending. And in terms of who uses rhetoric and dialectic, how are they like? People that are training or people that are untrained in Yeah. Basically everybody does it, right? So since everybody uses both rhetoric and dialectic, whether they're actually trained in it or not, to defend and attack ideas, what he is saying in this paragraph is that it's worth studying both of these phenomena, right, to figure out what it is that makes one disputant more effective than another, right? How is it some people can argue their case more effectively than others can? trained or not. So can I get somebody uh, to continue from now the framers of the current treatises on rhetoric? Thank you, Ryan. Now, the framers of the current treatises on rhetoric have constructed but a small portion of their art. The modes of persuasion are the only true constituents of the art. Everything else is merely accessory. These writers, however, say nothing about enthemes, which are the substance of rhetorical persuasion, but deal mainly with non-essentials. The arousing of prejudice, pity, anger, and similar emotions has nothing to do with the essential facts, but is merely a personal appeal to the man in the judgment case. Consequently, if the rules for trials, which are now laid down in some states, especially in well-governed states, were applied everywhere, such people would have nothing to say. All men, no doubt, think that the law should prescribe such rules, but some, as in the court of Ariel Pagan, practical effect to their thoughts and forbid to talk about non-essentials. This is sound law and custom. It is not right to pervert the judge by moving him to anger or envy or pity. One might as well warp the carpenter's rule before using it. Again, a litigant has clearly nothing to do but to show that the alleged fact is, is so or is not so, that it has or has not happened. As to whether a thing is important or unimportant, just or unjust, 
the judge must surely refuse to take his instructions from the litigant. He must decide for himself all such points as the lawgiver has not already defined for him. Okay, so there's a lot in this paragraph, right? Yes. But the first thing I want to focus on here is the binary distinction here between essential and non-essential. What does Aristotle regard as non-essential? Yeah, and why are these things non-essential? What do these things have in common? Their emotions. Yeah, it's emotional manipulation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So this Aristotle files under non-essential, right? Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, a thesis statement will be the close equivalent. Um, what an enthymeme actually is, is an, uh, a syllogism in which one of the premises is only implied, or it's left unstated. So to give you an example, um, I'm going to write a couple sentences from an old advertisement on a board, and you are going to complete the syllogism for me, okay? A bigger burger, is a better burger the burgers are bigger at Burger King which element of the syllogism have they left out yeah this is implied right So you've got the general principle, right? Application to a specific case, and then you draw the conclusion for yourself, right? So enthymemes are exactly this, right? They're a syllogism in which one of the premises is left unstated. So you've got your general principle, right? The argument you're trying to make in an enthymeme. And then you know, the application to a specific case. And then you are trying to draw a conclusion from that. So yeah, it does work rather like a thesis statement uh, backed up with some evidence. And this, yeah, this is what Aristotle regards as most essential. Right? What we should be teaching people is how to make sound arguments, not how to, not how to emotionally manipulate the judges. Now, <clears throat> what word does he use near the bottom of the paragraph to to describe the action, this kind of emotional manipulation performs on the judge. What is it not right to do? To move the judge to those emotions. Go back a little, go back a little further. It is not right to Yeah, why do you think he uses this word pervert? What does it mean if something is a perversion or to pervert something? Creepy. Okay, yeah, like, yeah. Right. We, 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 yeah, when, 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 when you refer to someone as a pervert, you mean they're usually some kind of sexual creep, right? Yeah. Um, but the word itself doesn't, ne like, it always has negative connotations, right? right? right. We never, call, we never call something a perversion if we think it's good, right? To pervert means something like to corrupt, right? To take something normal or ordinary or good or pure and uh, you know, make it somehow wrong, yeah, to spoil it, yeah. So to emotionally manipulate the judge, Aristotle suggests through language here is a corrupt practice, right? Now, how do we avoid having the litigants emotionally 
influence the judge. What can we do to guard against that? Okay, focus on facts, right? What's real and what's not. What's real, what's not. That's really all that, like, you know, he says at the, the end of the paragraph here, that's all the litigants have to do, right? Is establish whether something did or didn't happen. Right? Establish whether something is or is not a fact. Now, when Plato was talking about rhetoric in the courts, right? What was his problem with legal rhetoric when he was arguing with Gorgias? Because all rhetoric does is create belief, right? It doesn't create, as he says, instruction about what's just or unjust, right? It doesn't teach the judge or the jury about what's just or unjust. Does Aristotle seem to believe the litigants need to teach the judge what's just or unjust? Not necessarily. They just need to figure out what's true or not. So yeah. Whether or not that's just or not. Yeah, not the same thing, right? The judge should already know or have some concept of what is just and what is unjust. And what can society do to aid the judge in having a stronger concept of what's just and what's unjust? Consequently, if the rules for trials, which are now laid down in some states, especially in well-governed states, were applied everywhere, such people would have nothing to say. All men, no doubt, think that the law should prescribe such rules, but some, as in the court of Areopagus, give practical effect to their thoughts and forbid talk about non-essentials. This is sound law and custom. So what is he arguing for here? I guess kind of be quiet about all the emotions and just let them but what it comes down to is the rules, right? The rules have to be well drawn and clear and specific, right? If you don't want people talking about non-essentials, right, what you do is forbid talk about non-essentials in the courtroom. So you have to establish like rules. Yeah, exactly. If, if yeah, a well-governed society has well-established and clear rules, right? And he gets to this in the paragraph below this, right? Now, it is of great moment that well-drawn laws should themselves define all the points they possibly can and leave as few as may be to the decision of the judges, and this for several reasons. So what does he think makes a, a, a law well-drawn? Yeah. Like, kind of, like if this happens, this happens, you know, like a contingency, mm -hmm. you know, different yeah. scenarios. A law that is clear and specific is well drawn. A law that is open to interpretation, according to Aristotle, is poorly drawn, right? So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to show you two amendments from the Bill of Rights, and I'm going, to sh I'm going to ask you which one of these meets Aristotle's standard of a well-drawn law, and which one does or, or, or does less so. Right? Now, first off, like I know that one of these is particularly contentious, and people have strong opinions about it, and they're not trying to sway anybody's opinion one way or the other about whether it's a ju whether it's just or unjust. Um, look, I mean, you know, I'm a long-haired, beardy dude from the Northeast uh, with a PhD who hates wearing suits um, and teaches poetry for a living. Right? It's probably not that hard to suss out how I vote, right? So, you know, that's not the point. Of, like, I'm not trying to influence your thinking about the law here. All I am asking 
is that we take a contemporary example and try to apply Aristotle's standards to it, right? To determine which of these laws is well drawn and which is poorly drawn by his standards. Okay, so give it a minute. We all know that this thing takes a little while to warm up. Old yep. <laughs> One of these you will probably immediately recognize, the other you may not. So just read these over, take a minute, tell me which Aristotle would say is well drawn and which he would say is poorly drawn, and explain why. I think he'd say uh, the no quartering one was probably well drawn because it kind of, uh, you know, without the consent of the owner or in yeah. terms of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Yeah. And the Second Amendment is more of like, uh, well, when you say being necessary to the security of a free state, what is it? necessary. Uh, the mm -hmm. right of the people to keep them arms shall not be infringed. But you stop it there, so when you say shall not be infringed, it's not open to it. Sure. What does infringed mean? So to be infringed is, means to, to be limited, right? Or, yeah. you know, to be, yeah. yeah. Shall not be messed with. Yeah. Like if you infringe on somebody's property, right, then you start, like, you're moving, you're encroaching on their property, right? You're, you're moving your property onto theirs, things like that. Oh, like, with, like, neighbors and, like, you know, that invisible line that you don't cross that line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well, like, like if, 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 if you're my next-door neighbor and I dump my leaves on your lawn, right, then I'm infringing on your property. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, yeah, so the Third Amendment, right, Again, like we never talk about, right? Yeah, because, we don't use it. because yeah, well, not only that, but also because it's really clear was there's no debate over what it means, right? It's not really that open to interpretation. It says the government can't quarter soldiers in your house. The Second Amendment, on the other hand, we do debate because it's a lot less clear what it means, right? This whole thing about a well-regulated militia, okay, does that mean that this is a law that's only applicable if we don't have a standing army. Um, you know, the whole thing about a militia being necessary to the security of a free state, right? What, you know, is the codicil about not being infringed? Like, is that absolute? Does that mean you can place no limits on it, right? So, one way that we can see that Aristotle would consider this a poorly drawn law, again, whether it's a good idea overall or not, yeah, is the fact that, you know, historically, judges have not interpreted this law in a single way, right? We've only started to interpret it in the current, uh, the way the, way current, the current Supreme Court has done, um, really over the last 40 or 50 years or so. For most of the history of the Republic, really like our first 200 years or so, the well-regulated militia clause is considered the, the key part of the meaning, right? Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that the way it's interpreted now is incorrect, but because of Aristotle's standards here, right, we're applying Aristotle's standards, he would say that this is a lousy law, that this is not a well-drawn law. It's not clear enough what it means. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Do you want to put it back up? Okay, if you would take off like the first part and just the right of the people to bear arms should not be infringed, would that be more clear? Yeah, then Aristotle would say that that is a well-drawn law because it's obvious what it means. So if they both like stood alone, I think it would be more clear than so them being together. Yeah, what makes it unclear is the pairing of those two those two clauses, right? I feel like with the Constitution itself, with how old it is, I feel like it should be updated every couple hundred years or something, mm -hmm. just so it's more <laughs> clear and concise. Yeah. But not completely changing the law itself, because of sure. all the controversy mm -hmm. caused the certain changes. Well, and, and so, so then you, you, are, you are then what legal scholars would call a loose constructionist. So legal scholars break down uh, attitudes towards the Constitution in terms of what are called strict constructionists. Right? A strict constructionist believes that the text should be interpreted as written and that that's it, that's enough, right? Yeah. A loose constructionist believes that the Constitution is basically a legal framework that can and should be updated and changed over time. Um, the, uh, I guess we can turn this off now, right? <laughs> um, the, yeah, the, the two big uh, disputants over this in the early Republic 
were Alexander Hamilton, who was a loose constructionist, um, and Thomas Jefferson, who did not want the government to have any powers that were not specifically enumerated in the Constitution. Well, I mean, it shouldn't be up to just the government. It should be open to everybody who it affects, like the people itself. Mm -hmm. well, I think, I think that, that would be the case in something like ancient Athenian direct democracy. What we have is a, a republic with elected officials, so we elect people to go and represent our interests in the capital, like in the state capital and also in the federal capital, and we hope that they do that. And our means, our means for holding them accountable, if they don't, is to vote them out. Right. Although, as we, all, as we all know, that actually also rarely happens. <laughs> in part because you're um, So, <clears throat> Let's try to bring this back to Aristotle. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, because I mean it's you know it's 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 not yeah it's not irrelevant. I mean you know it's you know the we are talking about Aristotle is talking about what makes a good and what makes a bad law, right? And yeah, so a good law is one where the rules are clear and there are not multiple ways to interpret it. And why should there be few ways to interpret it? Mm -hmm. the yeah, that's where loopholes are created, right? It creates confusion, like in general, amongst mm -hmm. like one judge might rule this way, one might rule it. Yeah, and I think like yeah. It's I think it also invites the non-essential things that he was talking about. Yeah. Like manipulation by the Yeah, it's easier to manipulate a single judge who's deciding on a case if he doesn't have a clear law to guide him, right? So the clearer and the more specific the laws are, the less wiggle room the individual judge has, which also then gives rhetoricians less wiggle room for trying to personally influence the judge, right? For trying to play on his feelings. Now, we can also kind of break this into, if we look at the, the remainder of the paragraph, this whole universal versus particular argument as well, right? Um, Aristotle goes on to say, right, you know, first to find one man or a few men who are sensible persons and capable of legislating and administering justice is easier than to find a large number. Next, laws are made after long consideration, whereas decisions in the courts are given at short notice which makes it hard for those who try the, the case to satisfy the claims of justice and expediency. The weightiest reason of all is that the decision of the lawgiver is not particular but perspective in general, whereas members of the assembly and the jury find it their duty to decide on definite cases brought before them. So, oh, what did I do with the good one? So, when we're looking at the difference here between making a law and judging a case, what does the big difference boil down to? The weightiest reason of all is that the decision of the lawgiver is not particular but perspective in general, whereas members of the assembly and the jury find it their duty to decide on definite cases brought before them. What's that mean? Particularly if we fit it into our general interpretive context here. The lawgiver would the lawgiver would probably be more like a legislator. If we think about the functions of our legislative branch and our judicial branch, right? What does the legislative branch do? Make the laws. Yeah, they make the laws, right? And then what does the judicial branch do? Mm -hmm. 
The exe actually, the executive enforces them. Right? And the, 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 yeah, the judicial branch interprets them. <laughs> yeah, in fact, you know, maybe let's just do, a, we're, we're getting a little bit of political science lesson here too, right? You know, it's, so, all right, let, let's, all right, the executive is responsible for enforcement, legislative for lawmaking, and the judicial is responsible for interpretation. So the legislators who are making a law are creating a general principle that's supposed to apply to all cases, right? And they're doing this to give the judges a guideline, a clear standard, that they can use when discussing or you know when deciding a specific case, right? Mm -hmm. So this is actually kind of a weird argument for Aristotle that he's arguing the general is more important than the specific. Usually he seems to come at these things from the other way around. Right. But yeah, the, yeah, here the yeah the general is what matters. So, um, I want to look here on page 135 uh, because we are also talking about issues of you know, truth and falsity. Right? So, can I get somebody to read uh, the paragraph that starts, Rhetoric is useful because? Rhetoric is useful because things that are true and things that are just have a natural tendency to prevail over their opposites. So that the decisions of judges are not laid off to be. The defeat must be due to the speakers themselves, and they must be blamed accordingly. Moreover, before some audience, not even the possession of the exact knowledge will make it easy for what we say to produce conviction. For argument based on knowledge implies instruction, and there are people who one cannot instruct. Here then we must use as our goal of persuasion and argument notions possessed by everybody as we observe in the topics when dealing with the with the way to handle a popular audience. Further, we must be able to employ persuasion just as strict reasoning can be employed on opposite sides of a question, not in order that we may in practice employ it in both ways, for we must not make people believe what is wrong, but in order that we may see clearly what the facts are, and that if another man argues unfairly, we on our part may be able to refute him. Okay, you can uh, pause there, right? So let's take this and try to break it down a little bit. So the first point he makes about rhetoric being useful is what? Yeah, so when we're looking at that true-false binary, right? He's suggesting that the truth tends to prevail over falsehood, right? Do we see anything problematic about this particular formulation? Or perhaps even inconsistent in his argument here? Well, I think he's talking more here about the effect on audiences, right? Mm -hmm. That people who make audiences that are, make arguments that are based on truth, or pe people who make arguments that are based on truth to their audience are more likely to win their point because we have some kind of natural <clears throat> sense for what is true and what isn't. What that he said previously makes this problematic. Like, rhetoric is persuasion, so it, I mean, it doesn't really matter what's true or false, I mean, it's persuasion. Uh -huh. And persuasion, I mean, rhetoric is based in belief and not knowledge. Yeah, rhetoric is still based in belief and not knowledge, creating belief, right? 
Although he's saying it's more, it's, it's easier to make people believe something that's true than something that isn't, right? Right. But think about what he wants in the law courts, right? If people naturally believe what is true over what is false, then why do you need such tight rules to constrain judges, right? If it's easier to convince people of something that's true, then why do we need very specific laws to make sure judges toe the line, right? So they don't add their feelings into it? I mean, if, mm -hmm. you, feel, if you feel like emotional about something, then you won't really think about the laws or anything. You right. think about your emotions sure. and act on it. Sure. Like that's why with certain cases, like lawyers, that if they are personally, they can't be personally involved in it. Like they can't be right. related to the person. Sure. Because it will, it will change, it will cloud their judgment. Right. Say. And oftentimes, you know, we will see lawyer, like, you know, lawyers for the prosecution will often try to scare the jury, right, mm -hmm. of what, what the consequences will be if you let this person go. And defendants will often, like defense lawyers will often try to make you feel sorry for or uh, relate to the defendant in some way, right? So they will often try to forge a kind of emotional connection between the people deciding the case and uh, the defendant, whether a positive or a negative one. But I think the point I'm trying to make here, though, is that if true arguments nat naturally went out over false ones most of the time, provided the speaker is competent, right, then you shouldn't need to make such tight rules to constrain judges, right? So I think what you were talking about, I was thinking about it as you guys were talking, like the, the way you were asking the question, like he kind of doesn't believe what he's saying about like, okay, you have to make these tight rules for it to believe, but then yeah. if you say that, you know, the true thing will prevail and you know, they're naturally inclined to, to rule out, uh -huh. then you wouldn't, like you were just saying, you wouldn't need those rules. Yeah, and then what does he go on to say in the second um, little uh, codicil here? Before some audiences, not even the possession of the exactest knowledge will make it easy for what we say to produce conviction. For argument based on knowledge implies instruction, and there are people whom one cannot instruct. So there's going to be something that you just can't, like, sway? Yeah, but I think what he's talking about is, that is not just people, not people that you can't sway at all, but there are certain people whom you cannot sway with information, right? You cannot sway with knowledge. And I think there is actually something to this. Like if we look at you know, most um, you know, the, the psychological research surrounding persuasion, right? It's hard to get someone to believe something they're not inclined to believe by just throwing facts at them. Generally, they first have to trust the person or the source that's giving them these facts, right? So if I'm just spouting facts at you about, say, you know, ancient Greek philosophy and you don't want to believe it and you dislike or distrust me, right? Nothing I say is going to make an impact. Because they won't listen. Exactly. They're just going to shut me and say, oh, that's, that's, that's just that asshole. I'm not going to listen to him, right? Mm -hmm. If... I have already established to you that I am a person who is knowledgeable and of good character, who means you well, right? Then you are more likely to listen to me. And I think when he gets into uh, talking about the means of persuasion on 136 and 137, what does he regard as the most important mode of persuasion? What's the most important element in getting someone to listen? So, of these three modes of persuasion, right? We talked about them last time. Um, ethos, pathos, and logos, right? Which of these does he regard as most important? Pardon? 
Pathos. Why would you say pathos? Because uh, that's based on the emotions. Pathos is based on the emotions, yeah. Right. So but what does he think? Uh, if we look on pages 136 and 137 here, what does he think is even more important than the emotional appeal? Yeah, the character of the speaker, right? Yeah. That the, the first thing the speaker needs to establish is their good character. Is that why they're trustworthy? So then, yeah. just like you said, you can trust someone more and more private. Yeah, you have to establish yourself as benevolent and trustworthy and reputable before you can do either, you do either of these other things, right? Before either of these other things will have any effect. And which does he seem to regard as actually the least important, perhaps surprisingly? Yes, Pat. Yeah. This actually comes last. Thirdly, persuasion is affected through the speech itself. We have proved a truth, an apparent truth, by means of the persuasive arguments suitable to the case in question. There are then these three means of effecting persuasion. The man who is in, to be in command of them must, it is clear, be able to reason logically, to understand human character and goodness in their forms, and to understand the emotions that is to name and describe them, to know their causes and the way in which they are excited. It thus appears that rhetoric is an, out an offshoot of dialectic and also of ethical studies. Ethical studies may fairly be called political, and for this reason, rhetoric masquerades as a political science, and the professors of it as political experts, sometimes from want of education, sometimes from ostentation, sometimes owing to other human failings. So um, we're about out of time here, so I just want to kind of quickly break this down in terms of um, our seems to be about x is really about y formula. Right? So let's think about some of the things we've pulled out of this and discussed today. I want you to try to come up with a couple of things for why here, right? So the text seems to be about right, rhetoric and argument, but could also be about what? What other thing, like what other themes or binaries that we pull out of this here that we can Okay. It could, all, it could be about truth and falsehood. It could be about what's essential. What else? It could be about law and justice, right? If, you know, it, it could yeah it could be about problems you know problems in law right or problems in the court system. That would be a more specific version of you know the law and justice issue right, pointing out uh, places where this is flawed. It could be about you know universal in particular right. So the reason I, I, I do this, the reason I want you thinking about this is because if you have to do any writing on this essay, and you will have to do writing on one of these pieces um, coming up in a couple of weeks, right? Um, these are the lines along which you're going to have to think, right? So it's about this one thing, obviously, on the surface, right? But here's this other theme that I picked up out of it that I think is potentially interesting and meaningful. And you're gonna argue not just for that theme's existence, but also for why it's significant, right? And how it affects the way we should read the whole piece. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about anything? Today, over the next little like, assignment you were talking about in the beginning of class next week? The yes, the exploratory reflection I'll talk about next week. Okay. Yeah.
All right, happy Looper Kelly, everybody.